with demand expected to come back. But the question remains, does this mean the economy is back on track? Companies now, after experimenting with offshore in places like India, Philippines, and Poland, want to bring those jobs back. We invest in the U.S. We're the biggest exporter in the country. In the cycle and right now, we're creating jobs. From Radio America, it's Neil Asbury's Made in America, the show that explores American industry, large and small, and promotes American-made products everywhere. Put Neil Asbury's Made in America to work for you. A very big welcome to you today. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, what do you think about those numbers? Uh, 4.8 million new jobs. Uh, mm-hmm. Created mm-hmm. Uh, in in the month of June, mm-hmm. uh, the experts, you know, I use that word loosely, had projected three million, so substantially better there, and unemployment rate eleven point one percent, and um, versus what the experts had had thought uh, at twelve point five percent. So all around good numbers coming out of these uh, uh, job. Uh, numbers in, in hey look we're not out of the woods this pandemic is raging uh, we're having this sort of uh, second wave or I guess the first wave never quite ended but you're, you're having these spikes but you know what I think is that you know like, like people are learning to live you know with this new normal and they just want to get their lives back and uh, you know it may take more cases of COVID before we beat this thing but we just can't shut down our lives forever. And I think that's what you see in these June numbers is that more people are getting out and they want to go back to work. That's a good sign. Yeah, that's a great sign. And, and also, one of the other factors that came out this morning uh, was that uh, the, the numbers from the month before in May were, re- were raised from 2.5 to 3 million. So it's all, that, all that's good. You know, people are still very concerned that we're uh, still adding about 1.48 million people per month onto unemployment claims. Uh, but we'll see where that goes. Uh, but the number of people on continuing claims continues to come down. So the, the large picture is that we're heading in the right direction. It's just going to take a little bit of time to get there. You know, it'll be great to see the unemployment numbers get into the single digits. Yeah, that'd be great. And, and I think with a good June, a good July following up a good June, you know, we could start to see that trend line. And um, hey, look, July's a, a very important month. It's a long month. And, you know, let's hope more good news coming out early August as we review the July numbers. But hey, it is the 4th of July weekend. It's ice cream and hamburgers and hot dogs. And, uh, well, if you're in South Florida, it is not the beaches because the beaches. <laughs> there are, are no beaches. They're being here. closed. Don't even look at them. Don't look at in, them. In California as well. But, uh, hey, look, there's still a lot of really wonderful things that, that we can do. But, you know, how, how are our vets looking at the world today? Our, our veterans, you know, I mean, after all, this is the 4th of July. This is. You know, our veterans, this is a time to reflect and to think about all the sacrifices that's been made to create this incredible country of ours. And uh, despite all of our problems and the things that we're going through, the crises that we're experiencing right now, if you think back on American history, I mean, we've faced far worse and we've always come out winning and we're going to come out winning again. But let's talk about our veterans and, and what might be going through their minds right now. We're very pleased to have on the show the founder of Code of Vets, Gretchen Smith, who is also an Air Force vet- veteran herself. Gretchen, welcome to Made in America. Thank you so much for having me, Neil and Rich. I am just so excited about sharing our mission and discussing um, veterans during this special time of our nation. So tell us, you know, that's a great way to start. Uh, tell us your mission and how are our veterans doing and, and how are they coping with, with what's going on in our country today? Okay, we are a nonprofit. We're a 501c3. and We purely operate on social media platforms, assisting veterans in crisis and need throughout the country every day. Um, we've been explosive with our growth because of the way we operate. It's incredibly unique. Again, we use these platforms, and it just gives us the ability to raise funds throughout the nation with very little overhead, with a 1% operational cost. So it's something to be proud of. 
and our veterans know it's for them and by them. You know, we're all volunteers, and we're, we're it's simple. It's a grassroots mission, so we're taking care of our own one veteran at a time. And right now, through the time that we're going through in our country, you know, it's it, it's a very serious, tumultuous time, a lot going on with COVID and, with you know, with the protests. But you know what? Our, our American spirit in general, as Americans and as veterans, it's strong. It's resilient. It cannot be broken. And like you said, Neil, we've gone through tougher and darker times in our nation in the past. And this is this is one of those times where we need to band together and, and to make sure that our veterans know that we're here for them, that we remember them, and that what they have done. Um, is not forgotten. We know we would not have a nation without those men and women who put that uniform on to serve our country and secure our freedoms. Well, I, I think this is the time of the year to do it. I mean, everyone, first of all, I, I have to say this up front. Thank you so much for your service to this country. Uh, I sincerely thank appreciate you. the years you put in to, to protect me, make, make my family better. So thank you so much for that. But listen, we Neil, we support and, and have for years uh, veteran programs that are out there right now. To uh, oh yes, we've had many shows I and mean, many guests seriously about you know getting our getting our veterans ready for the workforce. And you know coming out higher I mean, vets, the yeah, most well trained men and women out there. Yeah, the the American uh, taxpayer has got this incredible thing. The American military, and we've trained so many great people with these skills. So, so question: Are we are we taking advantage of that as a country? All of these skills that we've taught our our men and women uh, uh, in our military that's coming into the private workforce? You know, I, I think that our American companies love the veteran community. There's still work to do, you know, as the veteran or as, as they transition out of active duty into veteran status back into civilian life. It's important that they have some guidance and an advocate with them to help transfer their skill set that makes sense to the civilian population and to civilian employers. So I do think there's an area there that you know we can approve on but oh yeah absolutely in general i see that businesses absolutely love our veteran community and it's always great to put that you know on on our resume because i really do believe for the majority it does put us at the front of the line and it should Uh, we should be honoring those who have secured us uh and and that's one great way is to hire a vet (laughs) i'm and i'm all for that we're you know we've actually been able to connect veterans with employers just through our social media platforms we'll put out a resume and say hey this veteran lives in lubbock texas or wherever it happens to be and we're you know and generally nine times out of ten we will have employers that say hey you know reach out to me and we've been able to make those connections um in the past couple of years we've been on on mission to help that so it's yeah we, we absolutely love the, the the idea of hiring our veterans first well which is great and and if you want to get somebody who has a can-do attitude and must mm-hmm. get done and be done as quickly and, and best as possible, which means perfect in the military, then th- there is nobody better than a vet. I mean, there just isn't because that's in their, 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 their fabric of their life and their soul. But when you say you, you access a database, how do you find out where these really good jobs are that are out there, these, these jobs that you're talking about that are high demand? How do you find them? I mean, how does that, that, what existence do you have out there to get that? Well, we have a LinkedIn account that we're starting to to grow and work on because again, we have exploded so quickly. <laughs> you know, we're trying we're trying to wrap our minds around how quickly we've grown. So we've got this LinkedIn account, and it's become a really valuable tool for us. And I've been putting the information out there for veterans if you need a job. And of course, you know, we've got so many out there that are unemployed because of the the economic shutdown with COVID. Um, I've been having them send me the resume, then I will post it on our LinkedIn account, and it's. It's, just, it's been incredibly successful. And when veteran, or when employers know that we've got a vet, hey, that's got the skill set they need, you know, in the area they are, it just seems to make a good fit. And, and most are, you know, really open to it. And I, I'm really proud of the businesses out there. LinkedIn is a great tool for all veterans, even, you know, if you go through Code of Vets or not. It's just a, it's a great way to professionally connect and grow your network, especially within your career field. So I highly recommend that. So, so Gretchen, you know, one of, I remember a, a show that uh, Dr. Rothman and I did. Um, Rich, you, you, you may remember this. It wasn't that long ago where uh, we were uh, having a discussion around these great skills coming out of our military, right? And then they go to certain jurisdictions around the country mm-hmm. with all of these years and years of training, mm-hmm. technical training, that, like, cost, you know, like massive amounts of money. 
and they got all these skills, but they got to go back to these places and and they got to get all these certifications before that they can actually yeah, I work. That show and it was absurd. It was absurd. <laughs> it was absurd. You know, after you get all these skills, then you know it's going to take you two years of 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 going through some kind of training before you get a certification. And you just finished ten years in the service. Yeah, if not more. Yeah, uh, Gretchen, have you heard about that? I mean, why why aren't we letting our vets come back and kind of go to the front of the line and all these certifications, which is just a bunch of bureaucratic nonsense? Many times, especially when it comes to our to our vets who've got more skills than 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 one can imagine, but yet they can't go to work. I mean, that just seems silly to me. Well, I, I think a lot of these certifications are a money maker. <laughs> that, yes. in my personal opinion, uh, yeah, that's, that's I, what I totally it is. agree with that. It, it's cash yeah, flow. Yeah, it is, and it's absolutely unfair to veterans who you know spent seven, ten, twelve, fifteen years, or even twenty years in the service to have come out and then to be expected. You know, they've got the experience and the training from the military, but to have to go and, uh, you know, go sit through these classes or workshops to get the cert- the certifications, whatever their field is, it's for me, it's a waste of time and money. They've already got the training and the, the valuable time in the military that's, you know, given them the skills that they, they need to be su- successful that particular job. Why not use that? Why not accept that? You know, and, and like you said, put veterans at the front of the line. There's still a lot of work to do in, you know, in our country with in regards to the veteran community because that we are a unique group of individuals. Um, serving in the military is just sets you apart. You know, they tear you down as an individual, but they then they rebuild you as a team member, and that has such value. To businesses, I just cannot tell you what a you know. It's just just what an asset to any career field, to any business. Uh, we're going to have to take a quick break. We're together with Gretchen Smith uh, from the Code of Vets. She's the founder. She's also an Air Force veteran. Uh, very very important stuff. Stay with us. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Rothman. And we are together with the Code of Vets founder, Gretchen Smith, who happens to also be an Air Force veteran herself. So, Gretchen, you know, it's 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 very sad to see what's going on in our country. I mean, over the last 90 days, you've got you've got covid, uh, you got the riots you see what's going on in our in our cities. You know, I, I got to tell you, I mean, I, I just can't watch television. I just it's just like so depressing to me. And, you know, it's just like I, I, I just want to run away from it, you know. And, you know, just hearing all of this commentary and how it's so politicized and, you know, it's it's just so it's just so. It's just so terrible. No, it's just dis- it's distressing. It's, it's distressing. distressing. That's what it is. So for just you know under you know norm normal circumstances and and, and, and for for the folks that are watching this, it's, it's like a train wreck, and uh, and then you have you know our vets who've come back from from foreign hotspots and wars, and you know they've watched their 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 friends. And their and their buddies to to die and all these terrible things that happen in 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 these in these places around the world that they've been sent to to protect us to protect our freedoms and and everything that they've gone through, and then to come home and and to see all of these things that's going on in our country. I mean, if it's depressing me, for someone who has been there, you know, with you know in in in, in war zones, you know, defending our flag. You know, how troubling it must be for them. And you talked about just a moment ago about, you know, suicide rates and just under normal circumstances, it's a real problem and and something that we must address head on as a country. But under the circumstances that you see now, this this must be elevating. It must be, you know, it must be even worse taking a bad situation and make it worse. Can you comment on that? Absolutely. We are definitely seeing a spike in suicidal ideation and in suicide itself. And like the numbers are already um, terrible as it is, 22, roughly 22 uh, per day. 
uh, which is totally mind blowing in itself. Oh my God. Yeah, it, it, it's it's yeah, it, it, it's just a huge issue in our community. It always has been. Um, wartime just takes a toll on a heart and a soul. And my dad was one of them. Um, my dad was one of our 22. And this is such a personal journey for me. And we've seen such an uptick. When I do our buddy checks out on social media, we've just been getting such a massive response. And I had a, a, a Marine, he messaged me just a few days ago and said, Gretchen, I, I can't take the chaos in our country. I'm a combat vet. I struggle with PTSD anyway. And this just adds to it. And he said, I wouldn't be here right now if it were not for my three kids. You know, we had a Vietnam veteran the other day post that I want to blow my brains out um, because I'm, I can't take what is going on in our country. I, I just can't stand the fact that I've served our country to protect our, our nation and our freedoms. And this is what we're watching it unravel in front of our very eyes. So those are just a couple of quick examples of what we're seeing um, on an almost daily basis, and it's it needs to be talked about. We need to shine a light on it because our we need to take a step back, and as as Americans, as a nation, and remember that our country is extraordinary. That we have freedoms that no other nation has. But there was a heavy price, and that was the price of serving in combat and keeping us safe. And these guys and gals, they they carry some trauma that we will never understand. They they've been in war torn countries countries they've watched their brothers and sisters being blown up being shot they've had to take a human life and to carry that it's just unimaginable and then to have this going on on our own soil right now it just it's almost impossible for them and what and we just deal with them one at a time as they come through our way and we find them we walk with them and we a nine times out of ten we can get them out of that dark moment but if we can't then we find them a place in their local area or we can actually fly them to a you know a facility where they can get stabilized and get the help that they need but uh, Neil and Rich this this is a huge problem in in the veteran community and right now it's a crisis so how do, I have to ask this question, and we don't have a ton of time left. How do you get funding, and if somebody wants to give to your organization, I think this is very important, how do they do it? Go to the CodeOfVets.com website. There's a donate link there. Uh, again, we operate on 1% operating cost. It is about veterans and for veterans. Find us on social media, on Twitter. We're on at Code of Vets. Um, we are Facebook, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, Code of Vets is the name. Find us, follow us, share the mission because we are putting the uh, veteran's face out there, his name, and we're raising funds for individual veterans to give them security to let them know that, hey, your nation cares and your veteran community is rallying around you. And we need all the support we can get right now, given what we're going through in our country. And, and Gretchen, are, are you getting the funds that you need? Yes, um, since April 17th, which is when we officially partnered with Charlie Daniels, we have raised in excess of $560,000, and we have secured uh, 565 veterans plus their families. Um, you know, a lot of them are out of jobs, uh, no paychecks, still waiting on unemployment. State uh, benefit systems are uh, just just inundated with all of these Americans being unemployed and we've been able to raise substantial amount of funds and again um, you know we, we're operating on one percent so most of it's being pushed right back out to these veterans in crisis when we're making sure they have running water lights that function and we're catching them up on the rent or mortgage so it's been a true blessing to partner with Charlie and but I tell you what we've got hundreds in line the need is great and they are beautiful men and women who have served us Hey, Gretchen, uh, unfortunately we're out of time, but God bless you and Charlie Daniels and everybody that's working with you. Very, very important. Gretchen Smith, Code of Vets founder, doing incredible work for our country. Gretchen, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Coming up, I have a good friend of mine coming on the show, Fred Hotchberg, who is an American businessman. He's a civic leader. And um, for, for, for eight years, Rich, he was the chairman and president of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. A very, very important job. Uh, a very good man. Coming up here just in a moment, going to talk about how international business is so important to our jobs. Made in America.
sharply higher at the open. Stocks continued to perform well over the course of the day Tuesday. And I think that bodes well here over the next couple of years for having bigger demands coming to this country. Now, more of Neil Asbury's Made in America. Very big welcome to you. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Robbins. So, Rich, from Veteran Affairs, and I mean, I got to tell you, Gretchen Smith, what an incredible American and what she's doing. And this is the 4th of July weekend. It's very important that we rem- remember our military and uh, our veterans. And uh, as they come back home, getting them back into the workforce, they got all these incredible skills. Uh, America is so blessed to have this this most I- incredible uh, 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 U.S. military that's that's watching us all over the world and protecting us. And then when they come home, they have all these skills that that, you know, hey, look, you know, they could be put to use in doing great things uh, throughout our economy, including the manufacturing segment of our economy, which gets a lot of uh, uh, airtime these days. Oh, yeah. And, and, and seamless because they're so well trained and they're very mature in what they want to do they, they, and they want to achieve. This is a great opportunity for Americans to be reunited and get involved in the workforce right away. They shouldn't be waiting. They should be at the head of the line. I gotta, I'm an American manufacturer. I own a $300 million business. I employ a lot of people. And I got to tell you, right now, you know, we, we, we can't find the labor that we need to run our manufacturing operations. So if you talk about bringing our manufacturing jobs home, well, we better have the skills. And I think a lot of times our politicians don't kind of connect those dots. Manufacturing means you have to have the skills to manufacture. And, uh, you know, we're not staying ahead of that curve. Our veterans could help us. But someone who knows trade very well, someone who I've had the pleasure to work with, a great American, um, an American a businessman, a civic leader. And for eight years during the Obama administration, he was the chairman and the president of the Export Import Bank of the United States. Now, I have a facility at XM. I've had it for many, many years since I started my business. We were a much smaller business when we got our XM line of credit that helps to finance our export sales. It's really an export bank of America because it's you know, a lot of lenders in the United States don't 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 collateralize foreign receivables because they have no way to perfect them. So the U.S. government created the Export Import Bank of the United States, and it is responsible for hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of exports. We don't realize how important that is because our competitors around the world, they understand how important this is. And, uh, you know, they have a lot of assets to make sure they get as much business overseas as they possibly can. So Fred Hochberg, uh, who has been the, the president, the chairman of XM, he's with us right now and he's just published a book. Trade is not a four letter word. He's one of the good guys. Fred, welcome to Made in America. Good to be here. And, you know, as you talk about veterans, we uh, we worked with a lot of veterans uh, at the Export-Import Bank. Um, uh, Steve Wilburn is one I think about clearly who is out in Orange County, California. And one thing about veterans also, they understand the world at large. They've been, they've been overseas. They understand what it's like to do business abroad. And so they often run really strong, powerful ex- export companies. So tell us, you know, the, the, the Fred, you know, under the Obama administration, you were uh, at the height of his administration. I mean, you were in a very, very important role. Your, your office, I remember having dinner in your office one evening overlooking the White House. I mean, you could just, you know, walk out your door and you're at the White House already. I know that you were a very <laughs> important member of the Obama administration. He started out, I would say, quite cold on international trade, but he really warmed up to it, you know, towards the end of his administration. Can you give us any color on that? Well, sure. I mean, first of all, actually, his first State of the Union address, which was in late January 2010, because it's after your first year, is when he announced the National Export Initiative, that we should double exports in five years. So in some ways, I would say he embraced this very early on. Um, Did we, you know, we increased exports overall in that five-year period about 50 percent, some countries 100 percent, some less, but it was the first time we actually had a national effort to say, we want to get more companies exporting overseas. And what happened, uh, Neil, is we had mayors and governors, uh, county executives wanting to find ways to promote exports amongst the, particularly the small businesses like yours uh, around the country. In fact, if I recall, don't you make 
an ice cream scoop. Am I correct? Is that my memory is correct? Everybody remembers that. that. Yeah, that's the Out zero of all the product. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like I less than 1% of my business, but everybody knows favorite. that. I love that ice cream scoop. Well, then it's the 4th of July. Of course, everybody's going to have one. Thanks for that plug, by the way, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would say that President Obama, you know, really did embrace that early. And and there was a huge focus on small businesses, not just the large companies, but also on really the small businesses uh, that are vital to exporting and employ a lot of Americans. Uh, and, in, and in also in very good paying jobs. So, um, you know, when the show Made in America, I mean, that was really what I worked on. Uh, and one of our strongest assets as a country, is the term made in America. People wanted to do bit, want to do business with Americans, wanted to do business with American companies, relied on American quality, innovation. Uh, and the fact is, when American companies say they're going to deliver, they delivered. They, we were much more, we were reliable. Well, and, and, and not only that, when they're doing it, they sing over there, which is remarkable. Yes. They all have George M. Cohen in their mind when they, when they do their job. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. When and it, it, This is rich. When, when an American organization, manufacturing plant, goes overseas, and it doesn't say made in America, but it is an American company, and it has American values, and, and, and it has American parameters in terms of what they want to get done, does that have a cachet as well? Because it is an American organization, American company, even though they could be in, in Vietnam or they can be in anywhere around the world, in Latin America for that matter. Does, does it have it from your point of view? I'm, I'm curious about this. Does it have that cachet? I, I, it does. And I would say it also, it largely, which we often ignore when we talk about exports, it ignores service exports, banking, legal consulting firms, IT firms, um, having that um, uh, made in America, that imprimatur of an American company goes a long way in adding credibility and, uh, and reliability to those financial and other kind of services. And frequently, as I said, we, it's particularly these days, we seem to be focused so much on manufacturing, which is vital and important. But let's remember Something like 70% of our economy is a service economy. And so we need to really also think about service exports. And that includes entertainment and higher education. Hey, folks, we're going we're gonna to have to take a, a quick break. We're, we're together with Fred Hotchberg. He's the former uh, chairman and president of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. He was the, Rich, he was the longest-serving chairman in the bank's history. Just thought I'd throw that out there. From 2009 to 2017, he's with us right now. Still a lot more to talk about with Fred. Stay with us. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Rothman. So, and we're together with Fred Hotchberg, um, American businessman, a civic leader, and he was the chairman and president of the Export-Import Bank of the United States for eight years during the Obama administration. So, Fred, not, not a lot of people uh, go into the administration and stay for the whole two terms, uh, but you were one of them, and I remember seeing that, and that was that was really quite astounding. So, that you were the longest-serving chairman of the Export-Import Bank in its history. I mean, that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I used to also say I was the long-suffering chairman because they got attacked by, <laughs> by, <laughs> by, by many people uh, in the Tea Party who didn't like what we did because they uh, somehow they had a misguided view of how we were helping American jobs. But, yes, it was a spectacular job. Probably it was, without question, the best job I've ever had. So let me, let me, let me ask you this. You know, you were eight years in the Obama administration, and then um, President Trump gets elected. And he takes a pretty radically different view, especially on our relationship with China and how China was being managed. Now, to be fair, uh, George uh, W. Bush, uh, even go back to Clinton or even H. W. Bush. I mean, everybody's talked about getting tough on China, but nobody ever really did. And then President uh, Trump comes on and, you know, of course, you know, the rest is history on how our relationship with China has been managed specifically uh, about trade. How would you comment on 
President Trump's handling of China. Do you think this was the right policy? Is it working? And if there is a President Biden, how might that be different? Well, I I, I actually think um, President Trump, from what I can see, and the trade representative, Robert Lighthizer, they really don't believe in global engagement. They actually don't believe that a globally engaged is a good thing to do, and how do we make it work better for us? I think they are much more about how do we do this by ourselves. They talk about how do we bring manufacturing back here versus how do we find ways to export more? How do we find ways for American companies, as we just were talking about, engage more in the rest of the world? So it tends to be a much more defensive posture uh, crying out for their protection versus how do we expand opportunities? So I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, I've obviously known uh, Vice President Biden for a long time, worked in the administration. Uh, you know, Vice President Biden is, I think, is much more, we have to engage the world. We have to be tough. We have to be firm. But engagement has benefits. And I, I think that's one of the differences, as you asked me, about where President Trump comes out on this thing. I think he doesn't see it as a net good for uh, American companies and Americans. Well, I guess I, I guess he's looking at it from a you know from a different spectrum, in in terms of for the average person on the street. You know, we had this conversation, Neil. We've been doing this a long time, and we had indicated that you know if it were not for the ability to produce things uh, differently or less expensively in other parts of the world, and in, in, in the case that we were talking about Asia and China in those days. That you know, folks uh, wouldn't be able to buy some of the clothing, some of oh, the, the shoes. quality of life. They, yeah. yeah, exactly. Their quality. Of, yeah, you went to the big picture. The quality of life uh, is so much better for so many people because they're able to acquire more, and um, and, and that's right. a benefit. That's a net benefit. And and if that shifts, then there is an unintended consequence of that shift. And I, and I guess that's what we're talking about right now. But but Fred, when you, when you're looking out there in the marketplace. And uh, we're looking for things that have changed. You know, you have. I guess you have to find the market that shifted, and you have to find a hard market and a soft economy in this old environment. Right. I mean, just to think of what you were just saying, Rich. I mean, I put in my book. Um, we now spend on average about seventy percent of disposable income, less than twenty percent, on food and clothing. Uh, it was close to fifty percent around World War II, and close to sixty percent at the beginning of the twentieth century. So. The fact is, yeah, we spend a lot more on things like education, health care, housing. But if you think about it, thankfully, basic things like clothing and food have come down enormously. And a lot of that, some is automation, a lot's automation, and a lot of that is trade. And it has also made us more innovative. So I think that sometimes gets lost in the conversation, lost and when we look at the benefits. And it's part of the reason I wrote the book was to say, hey, we kind of look at this, the whole thing, not just the negative parts are not only the positive parts. In in your book is called "Trade is Not a Four Letter Word," but that uh, but both political parties right now are really really playing towards that Midwest vote right now, and um, in taking a negative view on trade. And I know that you and I are cut from the same cloth, Fred. That that trade is good and trade means jobs. Um, right. But there's a lot of people in America that don't feel that way. What do you say to them? Well, well, first of all, if we want to sell to the rest of the world, we're also going to have to buy from the rest of the world. You know, trade is not a one-way street. So, and, and I think you said a lot of our products, we get components, we get fruits and vegetables from Mexico, from Canada, and that has made for a much more vibrant economy and a stronger economy. So I, I think we've got to sort of have that balance in there. We can't say, oh, we only want to export and not import. That doesn't work. Folks, we just heard from... A great American who's uh, a, a businessman. He was in the uh, President Obama's administration from 2009 to 2017 as the chairman and the president of the Export Import Bank of the United States, a very, very important organization. It's gotten beat up uh, uh, and unfairly so as, as corporate welfare. But I got to tell you, as a small business, medium business owner myself, uh, what Fred has done as chairman of that bank was absolutely vital to my success. And to be able to have you know, the, the hundreds of employees that I have. And uh, catch his book. Trade is not a four-letter word. Very, very important. Fred, thanks for being on Made in America. 
Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Rich. Great to, great to connect again. Come back. Come back soon. Coming up, Dr. Rothman and I have some final thoughts for the day. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, the show has flown by, but two incredible guests, Gretchen Smith, the founder of Code of Vets. Very, very important discussion about our veterans and getting them into the workforce and some of the challenges that they're facing that we need to be aware of as a country in these tumultuous times. And then Fred Hochberg, very great man. I worked with him back in the Obama administration when he was the president and the chairman of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, the longest-serving chairman in the bank's history. Very, very important. Um, we're very un- aligned on, on the importance of trade, and trade means jobs. And Fred was in a really, really important role of uh, creating these jobs in, in trade and providing small businesses, medium-sized businesses, such as my own, uh, the ability to do international trade because the U.S. banks will not collateralize overseas receivables. And if it wasn't for XM, you would not do the business. And that would be very sad because millions of jobs would be lost by Americans not participating in the global economy and selling American goods and services. But on that, Rich, I believe you agree. No, I totally agree with that. Uh, what I wish we had time to discuss, which we, we probably should at a later date after the holiday, and that is the USMCA um, um, agreement that that kicks in July 1st, you know, and here it is. So, uh, and we get a chance to talk to Fred about that. I would have liked to have done that. And not only that, I'm sure he interacted very often with Robert Lighthizer. So it would be interesting to get the color in that relationship and how that played out uh, since Robert Lighthizer negotiated the trade with the other two countries in the USMCA, and he's done it over in China. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, Fred is a linchpin. He's been around for so long. And and regardless whether he was with Obama or he's with Trump or he's with Bush before that, being in this environment, in this business, uh, he provides uh, great input to the industry itself and to our country. Either way, he, he just does that. So coming up, you know, in the um, in the election, how do you see the difference Is there a difference between a Democrat and the Republican position on trade? Now, Fred said, you know, the Obama and and, and remember, Obama came in and he's going to scrap NAFTA. We're going to get rid of NAFTA. You had the uh, Korean free trade agreement that had been signed but not yet implemented by Bush. Uh, Obama had, you know, kind of said, we're not going to sign that. We're not going to sign that. He didn't until his second term. And it was because it was renegotiated. Well, anyway, that was just giving him cover to say that he had put his fingerprints on it. But okay, both sides do that. Um, but he, he wasn't he wasn't the pro trader uh, when he got elected. I mean, that was one of the the distinguishing points that he had uh, uh, carved out for himself that the Republicans are giving the country away, and I'm here to protect it, and I'm going to keep all our jobs, and we're going to get rid of all these trade agreements. Well, he warmed up to it along the way, but he wasn't there to begin with because his constituents wanted him, you know, to to play tough, especially those folks in the Midwest. But right now, I think you have the Democrats and Republicans both singing from the same song sheet there of saying, we're going to protect you against China. and We're here to protect you against China. I don't see that there's a, a huge difference between the two political parties right now on this. Well, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, it's really funny to me that when I look at the political parties going back, particularly with Obama, we had a tremendous flight of corporations leaving the United States and going into China, going to other parts of the world. I mean, there there is a difference right there that when I would identify it, and there's a big flag, a red flag to me. Well, ironically, we're talking about China. But, um, but yeah, I, I think there is a slight difference. I don't know if we're both on the same side of the table on this one because I do believe that um, – you know, the Republicans have a different attitude about it. The Democrats, from my point of view, really let a lot of manufacturers uh, go overseas. And, and I think it helped the, the average, the common man, the, the, the man who, you know, puts on that shirt every day and goes to the manufacturing plant and develops something. And we got hurt. And I, and I really didn't see that come back until Trump came in, to be perfectly honest. 
And I'm a globalist in the sense that I believe trade liberates. Trade's important. I promoted it pan hemispherically. Uh, hemispherically, sorry, uh, North America, South America, and the Caribbean. If you want to throw that in a little bit, so I think it's important. But I just have a, I have a slightly different attitude about that. Yeah, uh, engaging with the world, I, I don't think anybody can say that that's a you wrong thing. You have to engage with the wrong world. How could you not engage with the world? I mean, I it mean, just there, there's no way that you can put your head in the sand. It's just not going to happen. The question is, how do you engage with the world, and what makes it uh, fair, equal? You, everyone's got to walk away as a win-win. Look, you cannot have a country. I know, I, and I'm sure that Fred would agree. You cannot have a country that steals hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Of millions of dollars of, of intellectual property all the time. Can't do that. That has to stop at some point. On Rich, and, Rich, and again, we agree. But, but unfortunately, we're out of time. Well, but we agree before a major holiday. I feel good about it. Now I can go blow something up. Now you can rest. Right. Fireworks. Go for it. But unfortunately, we're out of time. We're going to be back again next week for another adventure of Made in America, where we never stop fighting for your jobs. 